please welcome the now Dr. Lawrence C. Ross, Jr. There will never be a black SAE. There will never be a black SAE. You can lynch him from a tree, but he'll never sign with me. There will never be a black SAE. Now, how many of you have heard that song before? How many of y'all thought I lost my mind after receiving a doctorate? <laughs> that song was sung in 2015 by two 19-year-old uh, students at the University of Oklahoma, uh, Levi Pettit and Parker Rice. And they were members of Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity, and they thought they were singing a fun song until someone put a uh, video uh, a phone in front of them, and it went viral. And everyone around the country was shocked, shocked. How could these two students sing about lynching African Americans from a tree? The country was so shocked that even Fox, Fox News was like, yeah, that actually might be racist. <laughs> Three years later, 500 campuses, we've seen uh, campus racism on every place, whether or not it's public or private, large or small, east, west, north, south, midwest, it does not matter. We, if you want uh, racism against Latinx students, Sure, every Cinco de Mayo. If you want racism against African American students, every MLK Day, Halloween, Black History Month. If you want racism against a Native Indian students, Texas State, where they decided that they would paint themselves red and decide to have a sign that said, welcome to the tribe. We're seeing this everywhere, and yet we're still shocked. This is the state of education today. And it's important that all of you who are receiving your bachelor's, your master's, your doctorate degrees, understand that this is the landscape in, the, in which you are entering. You must enter with clear eyes and not rosy colored eyes. But I've been rude. I started this off with a song and I really should be saying, good morning, LaFetra College of Education. Woo! Oh, no, 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 no. Here, let me tell you something. I got up at five in the morning. This is not the, oh, the first day. This is, I got up at five in the morning. It's not every day that I receive an honorary doctorate. And third of all, I know you guys are celebrating your own uh, degrees, but this day is even bigger than yourselves. How many grandparents are inside the, uh, in, 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 this, in this place right here? Do you understand? Do you understand the bragging rights your grandparents have for you now? <laughs> they will now be able to go, not to their you know, rivals, but let's just say friends, and be able to talk about the fact that their grandbaby was able to get a bachelor's, a master's, and a, or a doctorate at the, at the Fetra College of Education. So I'm going to give you guys a second chance, because I have 18,000 uh, Twitter followers, and I will talk all about y'all. <laughs> but I'm going to say it's early in the morning. It's hot, you're waving your fans, but I'm gonna give you one more chance. Good morning, LaFetra College of Education. Good morning. That sounds much better. That sounds much better. My name is Lawrence Ross, I, or Dr. Lawrence Ross, as I should be saying now. Uh, I am very pleased to be here, and every graduation is a special occasion. Uh, obviously, we want to inspire you, but I have actually struck more in terms of being here because this is about some of the most precious commodities that we have in this country are, are educators. And so what I'm going to be talking today is going to be a, 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 hopefully inspirational, but I really want it to be a call to action for all of you in terms of how you look at, at education. Now, education, as was uh, spoken by our president, is a culmination of hard work, but it's never the individual genius of those of you with the caps. Everyone in your life has come together to uh, create a communal uh, support system for you. Whether or not it is your parents, your brothers and sisters, the person who does your hair, the barber, everyone is going to take credit for getting to here, and they should. Every last one of them provided some impetus for you to get your degree. And you should feel good about yourselves. You've achieved much, but you shouldn't feel satisfied. Don't feel satisfied because you live in a world where millions who look just like you don't have the same opportunity as you. They're shut out despite the fact of having untapped uh, talent, untapped ability, untapped academic skills, and they're sometimes trapped in an American society where the foundation is not deconstructed to where they can reach their full potential. And that's why I'm gonna talk about race and education this morning. 
But first, before we get into race and education, I'm going to first have to give you, for some of you, your last quiz that you'll ever take in your lives. I need to make sure that you can pass this quiz on race before we can go into the topic a little deeper, right? So I want you, and including everyone on stage too, when I point out your race or ethnicity, and this includes everyone in the crowd too, I want you to raise your hand and make a lot of noise, okay? And I don't know if you've noticed, but I am black. So as a point of privilege, I am going to say, where are all my black folks at? Yeah. All right, settle down, settle down. Where are my Latinx folks at? Yeah. Heard this was a Hispanic serving institution, uh-huh. Where are my Native Indian folks at? Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Where are my Asian folks at? And last but not least, but first in my heart, where are my white folks at? <laughs> All right, so you've, you've passed this part of the test in which you can recognize exactly who and what you are, right? All right, now I need to know whether or not you can recognize other people of different races. So, don't get shy now. All of my black folks, point to all the white people you can see. You know where they are. Point to all the white folks you can see. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. All my white folks, this is the one time in your life you get to do this. <laughs> Point to all the white, uh, black people that you see around you. My Latinx folks, point to all the Asian folks that you see. My, my Asian folks, point to all the Latinx folks you see. And uh, my native Indian folks, where, where y'all at? Right over here, raise your hands. Point to all the people you wish had stayed on their own continent. <laughs> now, everybody laughs, but I went to the University of Oklahoma, and a, a, a woman who was a member of the First, uh, First Nations was like, I'm not laughing. But the point of this is that when we talk about race, oftentimes what we say is that, well, I don't see race. And that is not true. We see race, and oftentimes what we're trying to say is that I don't want to see the negative stereotypes around your race, and so I'm going to ignore it. You should never do that. The point of, of, of understanding race is not that you ignore the race, it's do you recognize that race is a biological nothing. There is nothing biologically that separates any of us in this, in this room. I literally, if you take my, uh, my uh, Ancestry.com DNA, I have South Asian, Southeast Asian, Native Indian, a West African, Central African, British and Irish, and Sc Scandinavian of all things. They missed my Wakandan, but I'm just going to let that go. <laughs> it is a biological nothing when we talk about race, but it is a very sociological something. And we should never confuse those two, particularly when we talk about uh, education. Because in this country, we typically have people who are divided into two different areas, those who are race averse and those who are race aware. And oftentimes in this country, when we talk about race, and to a greater extent, white supremacy, when we talk about the greater foundation, um, our race-averse folks are always like, I don't see race, I'm colorblind, and I don't care if you're black, brown, or purple. They always throw purple in. <laughs> and so they go through their life thinking that we can just simply deal with the fact that we want to treat each other as human beings without understanding the sociological issues. Those of us who are in minority communities understand we are race-aware. We don't wake up on a Tuesday morning and say, ah, today is black day, and we're all the majority. We don't do that. When, for example, if I'm a student in, uh, at, at Lafaytra uh, College of Education, and I'm an African-American student, the first thing I do is scan the room looking for another black person and go, ah, I see you, we are over here. I can tell you that there are 475 African-Americans at this school. I can tell you that 12 were thinking about maybe transferring. I will know every single thing about the African-American community. And that's how we have to approach education when you go out into your communities, whether or not you're teaching or whether or not you're talking about uh, public policy. One of the problems in this country is that we are a country who, as Winston Churchill once said, will always do the right thing after we've tried everything else. And we are always a contradictory in terms of we believe in our, friend, our freedoms and democracy and ideals and principles. But at the, other t at the other end, we also recognize the fact that we have things that we have to deal with, such as racism and white supremacy, that we have to deconstruct. 
It does no child that we teach in education. It does no child who we are creating public policy for any benefit if we do not recognize those harsh realities. And that you have to deconstruct one to, in order to be able to create an atmo uh, atmosphere for the other one where they are free. There is nothing, for example, when we talk about race and education that tells us that we should ignore the fact that for 80% of the Latinx uh, community in this country, they go to a segregated school with 43% of those students, of those schools being intensely segregated. Intensely segregated meaning that less than 10% of the student population from K to 12 are white. For African American students, 74% of those students go to segregated schools with 38% of those schools being intensely segregated. Now there's nothing in, in, in inferior or uh, automatically inferior for going to a black or brown school. Except for the fact that when you go to a black or brown school which is so imbalanced in terms of race, there is a ten, uh, $75 per, uh, dollar per student reduction in the funding for every 10% increase in the amount of students of color at those schools. So what do you think the ACT scores or the SAT scores are at these schools? What do you think the, uh, the, the AP courses and the amount of AP courses are giving at these schools? We know in terms of how we deal with these schools is that they come from a root of racism in terms of, for example, redlining, which creates communities that are absolutely segregated. And those of you who are about to graduate, you should actually know how are local schools funded? How are schools typically funded in this country? Property taxes, so if you live in a, in a low income community, your property taxes are pretty much low, so therefore you have a poor funded school. We have to know that when we go out and go into education. Loving your children is one thing. Understanding your children is another thing. If you're working in the K-12 system, it's important for you to understand that it's not good enough just to love your kids. Because if you do not understand that implicit bias against black boys begins as early as preschool, when they come into your office when you're in child development, and that that can actually have an effect that by their fourth grade, they are not reading at book level, loving that child is not enough. You need to take this degree and be proactive and work to make change. If you, <laughs> if you are making public policy and don't recognize that the state of California for the last 22 years has been under a neo Jim Crow Proposition 209 that excludes and codifies segregation in this country, in this state, then you're not doing your job. You must learn that this degree that you're receiving today is the greatest weapon against all ignorance. And ignorance, <laughs> and ignorance that will hold back children hold back adults from their destiny, destiny that they can receive through academia. Now, perhaps it's because, and this is my little humble brag right here because I love my school, perhaps it's because I went to Loyola High School, Jesuit High School in Los Angeles, where we were told to be men for others, meaning that we were not just being able to take the academics that we took, what, that we learned at Loyola High School, but we were to, to apply those academics into the world and make change. Sometimes people go to college simply to get a job. I'm okay with that, but some, most of the people go to college to learn how to critically think. I'm looking for the critical thinkers in this audience because the critical thinkers in this audience will be the people who actually change the world. Racism is not new. It is not going away tomorrow. Racism on college campuses is not new. It is not going away tomorrow. But your degree, again, is the ultimate weapon against ignorance. And every time when you place that degree upon your shelf or against the wall or in that nice, beautiful cherry frame, I know if you're a doctoral student, you're going to put it in the cherry frame. <laughs> every time you see it, I want you to think to yourself, I am not done. I still have work to do. I, this is just the beginning for everything we, I have in terms of dreams, in terms of making an impact in this country. I love what the students at Yale like to say. It is a multicultural, white students, black students, Latinx students, Native Americans, LGBTQ students, and they have a, a banner and a saying that they say, we out here, we been here, we ain't leaving, and we are loved. That is how every student, regardless of their color, should come into the, stu the, the uh, educational system of this country. From Head Start 
to kindergarten, from K to 12, through high, uh, through, all through high school, going through college, and going in through uh, graduate degrees, they should feel like they have been loved all the way through, but not simply just for love's sake, but because you applied the knowledge that you had to de deconstruct the obstacles and barriers in front of them. What I want you to do, and regardless of whether or not you're a minority or not, is to recognize that racial justice does not require melanin in your skin. It requires people to bravely look it in the face and deconstruct it. And let me uh, end with this. I want to, again, say congratulations. Uh, my advice is to pay Sally Mae as quickly as she comes to calling, because <laughs> you do not want those problems. But the most important thing for you to remember, and this is important for you to remember, never think that you're too small to make a change in this country. Never believe that you're too small. You can and will be the change agents, this America that, that includes every child in this country. Again, thank you very much for the honor of allowing me to speak for you. And again, thank you very much for allowing me to do this. Thank you. Thank you.